Hello and welcome to November 2022's Self-Publishing Advice and Inspirations podcast. This is our member Q&A podcast where we answer all of our member questions, your most burning self-publishing questions related to craft, business, marketing, and anything else in between. My name is Michael Oran, and I am joined by Sasha Black. How are you, Sasha? Hello, hello. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic, even though, um, you know, listeners can't see it, but my room behind me is completely blank. I, uh, I had some water in my basement, so I, I have the uh, empty wall behind me. But hopefully next time we're back, I, I will be back to my regular uh, regular look and sound. So, Sasha, this is the third time. This is this is our third show together. I literally can't believe it. Like, uh, it fit, like I was saying off air that I can't, I actually cannot believe that we are yes. here again. It feels like last week that we did one. I know. I do, I do have an addition for the show today, which okay. is a kitten. And I'm just hoping that the kitten isn't going to cause any issues. <laughs> Hopefully we can get through lots of questions with no cat drama. But uh, okay. I'm just warning listeners. <laughs> so so for our listeners who, who are listening and can't see, describe your kitten. So if they so, hear anything, they can, they can see yeah. the image. <laughs> okay, so I have two, but only one is on the desk. I'm not sure where the other one is. But they're rag dolls, which is this sort of very floppy, relaxed, chilled out cat with these are long haired. Um, and they're, they're kind of color points. So they have gray ears, gray tail, um, and a white body. This is the boy cat. And then the girl cat is a creamy color with black ears, blackish brown ears, brownish three brown paws and one white paw it's very cute and a brown tail so yeah they look like they've been cute. dipped in paint <laughs> yeah I, I saw the aerial view um a minute ago and it looked like a rug like yeah a fluffy <laughs> fluffy yeah. right rug yeah. so so if you hear like a, or a yeah. you know, a noise <laughs> or me going no, is, no, stop it <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Although Howard tries to edit some of that stuff out. I yeah. doesn't all okay. doesn't always happen, but it's all it's all good. Cats are always welcome on the show. <laughs> I, I've got a dog as well, so sometimes Aww. you hear her. So yeah. All right. Well, let's get to the questions. We have a lot of questions this month, Sasha. So we do. this is this is gonna be fun. And and this they're, they're a pretty diverse group of questions. So the first one is from Michael. And Michael is a teacher and first-time author and is ready to move into the paid editor phase. And Michael would love to hire a developmental editor. He works on middle grade books in particular and wants to know if it's worth hiring out a, worth hiring a developmental editor. So let's answer this question from two, two angles, Sasha. If, yeah. you're, if you're a middle grade fiction or a children's author, does it make sense to hire a developmental editor? And then if you write like adult fiction, does it make sense to hire a developmental editor? What do you think? So I think that this comes down to each individual person's individual preferences and possibly how much experience you have. So as a middle grade author, the chances are that your books are shorter than a uh, adult author. Middle grade, often the upper end is around 50K. Um, and most and I say that with sort of air quotes, most editors will price depending on the length of the book. So on one hand, although a developmental editor is the most expensive end of editing, it is actually likely to be cheaper for a middle grade author. Now, in terms of whether or not you need one, I mean, how much experience do you have? Like if this is your first book that you've ever written and you came to this not having written short stories or not having studied writing or not having been a journalist or not having done literally anything in the writing world before, then you probably are going to find that there are some benefits to having a developmental editor purely because you don't know what you don't know. Um, do you need a developmental editor for every single book you ever write? I, I don't necessarily think that you do necessarily. It, you know, if you've written 30 books and you're selling loads of books, you're obviously delivering what the reader wants, right? So I always think it's very difficult because I do think there are benefits. For me personally, I had my first two books developmental edited and then I found that I wasn't gaining as much, I wasn't growing as much. Um, and so I didn't get a developmental edit on the third book. Um, part of that was around costs and part of that was around, I'd already reached a sort of 
plateau. So at that point, you can do one of two things. You can change to a different developmental editor and you'll get different things. But yeah, I mean, I think there is no right answer. I do think there are some benefits for a real newbie beginner author for your first book. Um, but again, what is your budget? What can you afford to do? Could you um, have five different authors read your book and get developmental edit uh, edit kind of feedback? Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. I mean, developmental editing is the most expensive editing you can buy. Mm -hmm. And if you do it for every single book, you're going to end up in the poor house. Like you're just it's expensive. Um, I, I am, I'm, I don't do developmental editing for my books. I, I'm just a big believer that I can take that money that I would have spent and put it toward other books. And by writing more books, I feel like I'll get more experience. Right. So if you want to use beta readers, um, you know, a copy editor that maybe does two passes of your story, some copy editors will do that where they'll, they'll do one pass, send it to you, and then you can send it back to them. That's often helpful. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's like, like you said, Sasha, there's no right or wrong answer, but I think cost is a major consideration. And, yeah. you know, a developmental editor is just one opinion. It's just one person's opinion and their opinion may not be good for your book. Right. So you also have to hire the right person and make sure that, you know, they're, they're going to be a good fit for your book. Because if not, I've heard from authors where developmental editors have done a lot of damage mm. to their, their manuscripts. So, you know, no, we never talk about that. So if you're going to pick one, you got to pick a, you got to pick a good one. One who's going to give you constructive feedback, one who's going to give you value for your money and then one that you can afford. And um, like you said, Sasha, I, I, I don't do it anymore. Um, I, I found that the, the diminishment, of returns is true. And I think that the money can be better spent elsewhere. But you know, if you're new and you, you, you want someone to help you, that is certainly one way to do it. Yeah, for me, it was definitely a shortcut to improving my writing, like for that first book. But I definitely thought, oh, I could see how many fewer comments there were in the second book. And so I was like, okay, this is definitely uh, d diminishing returns. Um, but yes, and just the other point that I wanted to make was uh, making sure you get a good one. One of the good ways you can do that is by using, well, if you are an ally member, you can use the uh, partner uh, provider list and the directory to have a look because all of the editors have been vetted by the watchdog. So they are legitimate, uh, well-behaving, <laughs> good mm -hmm. editors. So that is one way to make sure that you can find uh, a good editor and you find them by logging into the Alliance of Independent Authors dot uh, org and uh, navigating to services, I believe, and looking yes. in the services menu. Yes. All right. Next question is from Michelle. Michelle, I'll, I'll paraphrase her her question. Um, she is published right now through a traditional publisher and they did a poor job on marketing the book and she would like to get the rights to the book back. Unfortunately, the agent tried and they were told no, but she would like to try again and would like to know how. So how do you get the rights back to your book? Okay, well, <laughs> this is probably an answer you're not necessarily going to like, uh, but the only thing that you can do is look at your contract to see what the, the terms and conditions say in your contract. What are the clauses? Um, if the clauses are that you have signed away your rights for a set period of time or in in a in a um i hope you haven't done this but for the lifetime of copyright if you've given away your rights for the lifetime of copyright then there is no way you can get your rights back that's it you just need to um let go it's sunk cost fallacy uh, uh if you have given them away for a set period of time then you do have an opportunity to get your rights back however you will have to wait until that time period has elapsed and usually there's also some kind of clause in there in amongst the time that says you need to sell uh, less than i think it's like like 200 or 250 copies per year um and at that point if you are fulfilling or breaking i suppose although all of those clauses you're out of your time period and you're not selling that amount of books then you can then apply to have your your rights back um uh, but unless 
you've got some kind of magical unicorn break clause in your contract, I think ultimately it's probably unlikely that you're going to be able to get those back until the the, con the contract period has elapsed. One good book I would recommend um, is Take Back Your Book by Caitlin Duncan. Um, uh, she has written a fantastic book on this very topic, which is about getting your rights back. But like I say, the only answer is to go back to your contract and read the terms and conditions and see what they say. That will give you the answer. Yeah. And um, I would also recommend talking to an intellectual property attorney mm -hmm. because they'll, they'll be able to give you some advice, particularly someone who has worked with authors. You know, that's something that um, unfortunately you're going to have to go down that route and, and spend that expense. And you may not like the answer. You know, here in the United States, um, we've got a weird loophole. It's called copyright termination, where even if you sign, a, you know, like a, if you sign a bad contract, you can get the rights back, but you have to wait 35 years. Whoa. So, so <laughs> within 35 years, there is a specific process you have to follow to begin that process of getting the rights back. But 35 years is a long time. Yeah, we're 35. So, you know, I know <laughs> it's like a whole lifetime away. <laughs> exactly. So, um, I, you know, depending on what, you know, if you live in the United States, that that is maybe an option. But uh, I don't know if any other countries have that as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's an unfortunate situation. But uh, hopefully, hopefully you get the get the answer and the, the resolution that you want. OK, next question is, what should I have completed before I run a Kickstarter? This is from Michael. Well, it's funny because I actually was just a part of a Kickstarter that uh, funded last week. So, oh, congratulations! I, yeah, thank you. I didn't, I didn't run it, so I can't take any credit for it. But I have a, I have a story that's in uh, the anthology. It's a short story anthology that uh, got funded by it, and so I can share a, a few things that um, that the organizers did that basically allowed them to fund within 24 hours. Um, the first thing is to make sure you have a finished book. <laughs> Don't be one of those authors that, that goes up on Kickstarter and says, hey, fund this book, and it's not written yet. Like, that is a real easy way to just get readers to be like, no, I'm not going to do this. Because everybody's been burned, right? So just, just don't do that. Make sure the book's finished first. Because all, all the books or the, the stories in this anthology were all edited. The cover was done. I mean, everything was done before... Um, we we went ahead and published it. So that's thing, public enemy number one. Uh, the second thing that they had done before all of that was the marketing. So if you look at, if you study the the Kickstarter pages of a lot of pages that fund, they've got a lot of good marketing materials on there. So there's like um, images, there are videos, there's other sorts of like things that make make the sales copy pop. All right, so they had all that done before it was funded. And then the third thing they had done was they knew exactly what the stretch goals were going to be. So they, they just went in with the mindset that, okay, this is going to fund when it funds here is what we're going to do for the people that fund it. You know, so if we get to $3,000, here's what we're going to do. If we get to $3,500, here's what we're going to do. If we get to $4,000, here's what we're going to do. Right. So they had all that planned out. Cause what, what happens a lot of time is it, you, you, put up a project, it funds and you're like, oh crap, I need to come up with stretch goals. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, it, it doesn't go as well. So they were extremely organized and it was really, I think everyone was surprised that it funded so quickly because I think this was like one of their first Kickstarters. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I would have in place at a minimum, but then you also have to have a plan in place of, of how you're going to spread the word about the Kickstarter because Kickstarter sometimes will monitor the projects and then they'll, you know, they'll say, this is a project we love, you know, and you'll get a little bit more visibility, but you can't really count on that. So you've got to kind of think about other ways to, to get it in front of people. Have you ever done a Kickstarter, Sasha? Nope. 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 <laughs> nope. Nope. No, 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 no. I, I am in awe of everybody that does Kickstarters and I look at it and I have ideas about kickstarters that i could do and i just like i it is in my not right now bucket like i don't have the capacity yeah. i need to focus on what i can do and the kickstarter is not one of those things <laughs> yeah well, there's something to be said about uh, focusing 
You know, maybe, uh, yes, maybe one yeah. day. I think uh, Definitely. You know, a lot it's, more people are doing it. Yeah, it's not a never. It's just a, I've got so much on. I just can't. I just can't right now. Yep. Yep. I, I'm planning on uh, dipping my toe into these next year. So like I'll, I'm, I'm curious on how it's going to go. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cool to be a part of one that's funded. So I learned a lot by kind of studying what they did. So, okay. Next question is from Daryl. Where would I find proofreading and editing resources on the Ally website? Oh, that's a nice and easy one. Okay, so navigate your way to allianceindependentauthors.org and sign in. That is the member website. And then you need to navigate to uh, the approved services menu where you will find the partner directory for 2022, which lists a lot of our partner members. Um, but then you can also navigate around uh, places like the discounts and deals section because they may there may be a discount or deal, especially given that we've got Black Friday coming up. Um, and then you could also have a look on the search for a service section, which is under the same menu. Um, and that will bring up a list of um, all our approved partners. And you can kind of search uh, using whatever search term you're, you know, copy edits or proof or whatever, you know. Yeah, nice and easy. Excellent. Yep. All right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely stop at us first if you... Um... I want to find a proofreader editor because we've got a lot of great, great people that work with us, you know, that are in that directory. So um, great information. Next question is from Anthony. Do you have a suggestion for a sample contract when agreeing to work with an audiobook narrator? I actually don't, um, but I actually just did a contract with a narrator last week. <laughs> so um, actually, I, I, I'm I figured, Sasha, if you don't mind, I'll pull it up and yeah. um, I'll, I'll go through some of the highlights. So this is not a sample. It's not legal advice, but it's fresh on my mind because it's something that I just signed. And um, I did have to write this myself with the narrator. So uh, essentially, when you think about a, a contract with a narrator, um, Anthony put this in, his, in, in the um, question, and I think it's an important one. You don't want to do a royalty share. You know, you're not going to pay for a royalty share. So that's nice because you, you can get the book done. But royalty shares are generally in perpetuity or for a very long time. So you, if you if you later change your mind, you're going to have to buy out your narrator. So the best thing to do is to pay the narrator up front, usually a flat fee. And that way you own the rights to everything. All right. So I just want to click make sure I set the table on that. But um, some things that, you know, that are in my contract, again, it's not legal advice. You know, you'll have to draft your own language and, and figure it out. But um, what what is your rate per finished hour that you're going to pay the narrator? That's something you want to put in writing. You also want to talk about the workflow. So I just followed ACX's work, workflow. So my, edit, my um, narrator and I are working outside of ACX. We're just working by email. And basically, you know, he provided me a five minute sample. I reviewed that sample, approved it. And then upon doing that, he recorded the rest of the audiobook. And then, um, you know, if there's any edits, he'll make those edits in a, in a reasonable manner. I won't be unreasonable with the number of suggestions I give him, that sort of thing. And then, you know, once the, all of the, um, the files are ready, we will submit those to ACX and find a way. If the narrator or if there's any issues with quality control, the narrator will correct those as soon as possible. Um, you also want to think about your payment terms. So, you know, how much are you going to pay the narrator? How do you calculate that? So the way I did it is, you know, ACX recommends that um, 9,300 words are per finished hour. So take your word count, divide it by 9,300, and that gives you an estimate of what, what your finished hours are, are going to be. All right. And that's usually what my narrator and I agree on. And then usually what I'll do is I'll pay him 50% up front. And then once he's done and the, the files have been approved by ACX and all that, then I'll pay the remaining 50%. And then sometimes when you estimate those finished hours, they don't always line up. So what I've agreed to do with my narrator is that if they're, if the finished hours ends up being more than we agreed, then I'll pay him the difference. If they end up being less than we agreed, I don't pay him. I don't, I don't pay him any less, but um, I, we still agree to what the, the estimate amount was just kind of keeps things a little bit cleaner. All right. Um, I also asked for an invoice up front. That's just good for taxes. 
And then I also have a waiver of rights. So in exchange for payment for the audiobook, the narrator agrees to waive all royalties, claim title and interest and blah, blah, blah to the audiobook. That's kind of important. And then also um, the narrator signs that uh, they agree that all copyrights to the audiobook and the sound sound recordings belong to me. All right. So the the last things are no different than what you would sign if you signed with ACX. Um, ACX says that the sound recordings belong to you. And it says that uh, the narrator is not entitled to any royalties if uh, you do a flat fee. But you just want to put that in writing so that everybody's on the same page. So those are some of the things that I hit in my in my contract. My, my contract was only two pages long. You know, don't go overboard. I think a lot of people could probably do it in one page. So just keep it simple. Keep it in plain English so that both parties are on the same page about exactly what needs to be done and when. And I think you'll be fine. So, Sasha, have you um, done any audiobooks lately? Um, I have narrated one of my nonfiction books, and I am nice. four sections away from finishing my second audiobook. So, yeah, nice. I haven't done my fiction uh, at the moment, but I think the next lot of fiction, maybe um, the first lot, I'm not going to do, but yeah, maybe the second lot. That's awesome. So, how how long did it take you to to? <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, dear me. Did I open a can of worms? <laughs> oh, so I actually have a whole hour episode on my own podcast all about the lessons I learned from my from my first um, attempt at narrating. So the, the funny thing is, I was trained as a um, voiceover artist as a teenager. Really? Yeah. So I, I already had like a basis for it. What I didn't have was the technical st- skill. So um, I made even though the narration was good, I made a lot of mistakes in the first one, corrected it all. And I'm like, I love the audiobook, but this one has gone a lot smoother. So I would say that um, it, it probably, well, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I've done it over a long period of time, but it's probably taken me t- two or three weeks, I would say, of oh, wow. like, full time to 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 do it but that's because I'm editing it myself I'm narrating mm-hmm. it myself the only thing I'm not doing is I outsource the proofing I give that to my VA because I've listened to it so many times at that point I can't right. see the wood for the tree so she proofs it for me and then I go and do the pickups um and then I send it to someone to master because I can't be dealing with playing with the levels and stuff like that so then they do the levels for me and then I upload it. So yeah, I haven't had to do the contract thing, but I probably will. Cause I don't, I don't know if I would do my fiction as a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I could do my fiction. Yeah. I think there's that, that, that at least for me, I don't think I could ever do my fiction. Like I, I hear that voice in my head and I'm like, yeah, I would sound so amateurish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, I don't think the I would non- sound good. But the nonfiction is that first person nonfiction. So it, yeah. it's I write in my voice. So it'd be very odd for somebody else to narrate it. Um, so that's why I do do that nonfiction. Yeah. So so that's two contrasting uh, ways to do it, folks. You yeah. Know? <laughs> that's, uh, that's good stuff. So maybe you can uh, get the link to your podcast episode where people yeah. could listen to that. Because that's often a, a next question is like, I can't afford audio. So I would like to n- do my own. Yeah, so maybe yeah. we can link to, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. My, my wife built me an audio booth, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So you, you got the whole, the whole uh, burrito oh. there. It's oh cool. yeah, no, it's like seriously professional setup. My, my master was like, how, where did you record? And I was like, in my garage. And he was like, you have like professional levels. And I was like, why? Thank you. <laughs> so it's so we're going to hear some velvet tongues. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you just listen to that and you're just going to put it in your ears and it's going to be like ear candy. <laughs> Hello, darling. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and let's move on. <laughs> all right. All right. Starting to get uh, M rated here. On yeah. the show. Okay. Next question is from Barbara. How do I go about getting the correct categories for Amazon on my books? So I'm assuming you have some categories and that you mean you want to change them. So Amazon doesn't uh, really put this anywhere, but you can have up to 10 categories. All you have to do is log into uh, the KDP uh, uh, portal and then uh, click through to the help desk. And then um, there's a section of uh, options on the left hand side. And if you just click through until you find categories and, and keywords, I think I think that is all one section. I can't remember without looking, but um, and and then click on that, and then it will give you the option to um, identify the book. 
uh, by ASIN or, or link. And then uh, you need to give them the full um, what's the word called? The full string, the, the full, full category. String, the full yeah, path. The yeah, the full pathway. Thank you. So uh, books, for example, then science fiction, then, you know, uh, science fiction, fantasy, science fiction, fantasy, teen and YA or whatever the pathway is. So you need to give them that entire pathway. And so you can do that by going to Amazon and then clicking through uh, and seeing the pathway, like all, all the down into the sub niches. And then... Um, one thing that I don't know whether people will realize is that um, the Amazon store, all of the stores are different. So you have to email the Amazon, or you have to give the Amazon.com uh, pathways, and then you have to do it again for the UK pathways and so on and so forth in all of the different country stores. So don't just go on to that, give your Amazon.com link and think that that's done. You do have to do the pathways and the pathways are not always identical in the different stores which is why i don't know why that is the case yeah, but it is the case yeah so you have to check each site um but it is that simple it's literally an email to uh to amazon and and of course making sure you've clicked the right categories in your metadata so when you um have loaded a book in your metadata section just go through the con uh, the, the page before content I think it is and it will tell you what categories you've picked just make sure you've picked the right ones and if not delete it and start and put in the right one yeah no that's such it's a great tip I mean it, it doesn't cost you anything to do other than your time you know because people are always talking about what are some low cost you know or free marketing strategies and is this this is one I don't think a lot of people take advantage of um, that said you know don't don't put your book in every category under the sun you know, if your book is is not a vampire romance, don't 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 abuse this system, right? But if there are multiple categories that you can get your book into, take advantage of that. And if you need a little bit of help on getting determining what those categories are, you can use a tool like Publisher Rocket by Dave Chesson. That's a great tool, and uh, that'll help you with the category research. Help you kind of with with anything you need in terms of. All right, what are the different categories that are available in the ebook store versus the the paperback store and in, in, in different countries? That would be my first port of call. And, and we'll throw we'll throw a link to Publisher Rocket in the in the description or in the, the show notes. Okay. Let's see. Our next question is from Ethel. And when initially contacting a bookshop buyer by email, should I include my A4 information sheet or wait until I get a reply? And Ethel, this is a really good question. I think it's going to depend on each individual bookseller's whims. You know, if, you, if you're conducting any kind of business by email and you're wanting like a, you're wanting to do some cold calls, I think you have to be, be cognizant of spam filters and junk mail. So some people have their email set up to where if you send them an attachment, it can be very easy for the, 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 the email to kind of go into their spam filter and they may never see it. So what a lot of people do, and this is not just for book buying, but this is kind of just in general. Um, what a lot of people would do is send, send um, an email. And then if they reply, like you hinted, then send them the A4. All right. So that's to me, if I was doing that, that probably would be the answer. Um, but I, I would also highly recommend that you check out our, our book, um, getting your, your book in bookstores. I don't think I got the exact title correct, but it's, it's by, um, by Debbie Young. So we'll throw the, we'll throw the name of the, the exact name of the book. This is a, one of our ally member guides. So if you're an ally member, you can get this for free by logging into your dashboard and just going to guide books and you'll be able to get it. Um, you can also purchase it on our on our website as well if you're not an Ally member or wherever you buy your books because they're they're available there as well if you want to support Ally. But um, Sasha, do you have any any advice? No, I don't think so. I have not spent a huge amount of time doing this. I've got my book uh, books in one bookstore locally, but um, it was it was quite a lot of. Um, <laughs> work and hassle. Um, I have got a local Waterstones that want to stock my upcoming pen name, um, but they've had some issues finding the books, even though they're on Ingram. So I, that's something that 
that needs sorting. But again, it is one of these very long time consuming things. And ultimately, unless you've got really a, a good distribution deal, it's I don't find it that worthwhile for me to to spend time on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on it, as with all things, it depends on your goals and it depends exactly. on how much work you're willing to put in into it. The, the, there, there, this is certainly a rabbit hole that you can go down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, the name of that book is, is your book in bookstores by Debbie Young for anyone who wants to look that up. So again, ally members get that free. Just log into your dashboard. It's under our guidebook section. Um, but you can look it up. To actually answer the question, the way yeah. I got my book into that bookstore, sorry, I realized I went off on a tangent, That's is okay. I, I actually printed the sell sheet um, and handed a physical copy, uh, uh, like a, um, what's it called? <laughs> An ARC copy, physical okay. ARC copy with the sell sheet rather than emailing it, the information sheet, I just handed it to them. And uh, that was how I did it. But yeah. I've, I've, I've never gone down that route, so... Uh, that's that's interesting for me you know I, I i feel like i want to do it at some point next year but you know it's just a time benefit yeah i kind of think but you know it's it's um honestly you know, the easiest way is to just tell your readers to ask your local bookstores to order the books because yeah. like that is how i've had people send me pictures of my books in bookstores in, across america and i'm like i don't know how that happened but thank yeah, you yeah. <laughs> You know, that's actually the easiest way to do it. Yeah, it is. It is. So, okay. Next question is from Aurora. And the question is, Amazon has given me links to my author page and website, which do not work. People who tried to access these links cannot access my books or leave reviews. This is preventing me from selling my books. How do I resolve this? Well, uh, First thing first, I mean, definitely reach out to Amazon. I'm, I'm sure that you've done that. I, I don't know how they would resolve that. I mean, if they if they gave you a link that doesn't work, certainly that's on them to to figure out and and resolve. So that that would be my first answer. And in your email, continue to ask for it to be escalated. It's very key that you ask for the escalation. Please escalate this um to a manager or words to that that effect because yeah. um often you will get uh automated responses that don't that don't necessarily help so i don't know if you've already got like a human responding but if you haven't put in your emails escalate this please escalate this and that should get you a person at that point or call them because quite often you can go into your kdp dashboard and call um and that they will deal with it there and then, um, as opposed to you having to wait for the email responses. So that is another way to um, to work it. Very well said. All right, our next question is from Caroline. I'm looking for the best ad-free thesaurus. Do you have it? Do you use a thesaurus, Sasha? Like a all like a... the time, but I just use like thesaurus.com. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I have too. I mean, at one point I had a subscription to Merriam-Webster. Oh, cool. And I, I think that, ha I mean, it was like $6 a year or something. like. I mean, it was some super cheap thing. And I think that was ad-free, but, you know, yeah. Or, or buy a physical one. Yeah, you could buy a physical one. Um, I'm sure there's probably thesaurus apps too that you could install. Oh yeah, I, I use computer. the dictionary app. Um, I have a dictionary app and that has a thesaurus inbuilt in it. I'm not sure if it has ads though. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that 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 is, we have never gotten that question on this no. show <laughs> before. So that that is, that is, uh, that gets a gold star. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's what I would probably do. Um, I think if you want an ad-free thesaurus, you're either you're either going to have to pay for it or you're going to have to use a physical one. Unfortunately, yeah. that's yeah. just the the way the way that things are going. You know, you don't want ads; you kind of have to pay for it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of there's plenty of good ones out there. I mean, any of the brand names, if you wanted to use those, I, I bet you know, I bet they would be probably pretty cheap. Like I said, I didn't pay that much for Merriam-Webster. So, okay. Next question. I, I think they had like a part B to that question, though. Oh, there there was a part B, but um, 
uh, I'm looking for the place on the website where uh, the, the member forum. Which where's the best place to find the member forum? Sasha? So so that's on Facebook, and if you email in. Uh, to the customer services desk, which hopefully I'm hoping that you have the email address for that, um, then they will be able to point you in the direction of the uh, member forum. Or you can go onto Facebook and search um, Alliance of Independent Authors, and that will bring up the page and the author forum. Yeah, just just go to selfpublishingadvice.org slash contact and fill out the form and there we, we can, go. We can, get, we can get your link. I knew there was an easy link somewhere. <laughs> yep, yep. So I could give out the email, but it, it's just easier to go to the yeah. contact form. Okay. So here is the perennial question we get often, at least <laughs> once a month. Can you please tell me if there is still a discount code for Ingram Spark and how to get it? Yes, there is always an Ingram Spark code. Well, there has been for quite some time. Hopefully we shall have it for <laughs> the long term. But yes, yes, we do have it. The thing that changes is the code. So the code will change every single month and you will find it in your Ally dashboard. So once again, you go to allianceindependentauthors.org and navigate to approved services, discounts and deals. And then you can have a hunt in there for uh, the Ingram Spark code. You get five uses per month and... Um, yeah, you get five uses a month and the, and the code changes monthly. So you just need to go in and double check that code. Yes. Yep. You, you, don't forget to change, check uh, monthly if it's been a while since you've done your last book. So sometimes people get confused by that. So, okay. Um, next question. This is, this is a, a quite a few questions in one. So we'll, we'll kind of tack it, tackle it rapid fire, Sasha. Uh, this is from Janice. And the first question is, are Amazon ads a good place to start with marketing? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like, how do you, okay, well. Okay, so maybe we can, we can narrow this down a little bit. So yeah. Janice publishes children's books on health and wellness. Oh, okay. Possibly not then. So um, we have a children's book advisor called Karen Inglis, who has um, done a ally guidebook. Um, I don't know if it's a full guidebook or a mini guidebook, but we have content on children's book marketing. There are also a ton of blog posts on children's book marketing on selfpublishingadvice.org. So please do go and go to the website and search. Um, what I will say, Oh, and Karen also has her own book uh, on children's book marketing. The difficulty with children's book marketing is that the people you are selling to are not the people reading. So you are actually right. marketing to the parents. Um, a lot of children's book authors spend a lot of time marketing to schools um, and doing wholesale um, bulk uh, and author talks in schools. So I would before you spend any money on marketing, I would advise that you go and read Karen's book, The Ally Guide, and search the website because I my gut says that Amazon ads are probably not going to be that worthwhile. We did a recent case study as well um, on a chat, and I will find the link and put the link in the show notes uh, because that was very interesting about how they had... Um, marketed their children's books. So I will find that and put it in the show notes. Okay. And um, that was a case study on marketing children's books? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just typing this so we can put it in the show notes because if I, if I, I have to do it in the moment because otherwise yeah. I, I, I forget. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So the next part of Janice's question um, has to do with Ingram. Is there another avenue for Ingram Sparks? Like what's the best way to advertise your books that are distributed through Ingram Spark? Yeah, I can take this one. I, I would I would just start with Debbie Young's book, your book in bookstores. Start there. Um, I know Ingram Spark has done some like webinars and stuff on ways that authors can maximize their you know, their, their distribution and their reach. I, I would start with some of the resources that they offer and um, use the two of those, those resources together to kind of give you some ideas. 
but yeah, if you're if you're if you're wanting to focus on Ingram, I mean, naturally you've got children's books, right? I mean, you're going to want to think about think about that, and uh, definitely, and then add in Karen's resource to that as well. So, so you got three things. Look at what Ingram Spark has to say about this, Karen Inglis's book, and then Debbie Young's book on getting your book into bookstores. And I think that will help you kind of form a form a map of of where you need to go. Okay. Well, Sasha, I think that is all of our questions for the month. Can't believe we've done, we've smashed another month. We Look have, <laughs> we have another, another month and um, we'll be back next month as well. Just uh, it'll be December 13th um, is when we're going live. And then the following Friday. So that'll be what the 16th. That'll be our last show of the year. Ooh. So Christmas, Christmas, holidays, everything. So it's kind Love of hard it. to hard to believe that it'll be the end of the year next time we talk. Oh, I don't even. I can't. Can we, <laughs> oh, that's horrendous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so for all our friends who are working on NaNoWriMo, good luck. Yeah. And then just know next time we next time we're in your ear, it's going to be the end of the year. Holy moly. All right. Well, Sasha, I hope you have a good month and thank you everybody for listening and we will be back. Remember that if you would like to ask your questions, if you're an ally member, just visit us at uh, selfpublishingadvice.org. And um, um, yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes <laughs> to the, to the forum where you can ask the questions and um, we would love to love to talk about it on, on air. All right. So have a, have a great, great month and we'll talk to you next month. Bye.